What are the 10 most intriguing mysteries of the unknown? Do we live in a populated universe? When I first realized I was an abductee, I was furious. I was angry. Do our souls live on after death? I looked around and saw no one. I realized I had seen a spirit. Believer, skeptic, or downright debunker, we all have an opinion. Join us as we count down the bizarre, the sublime, and the terrifying on the Ultimate 10 Unexplained Mysteries. We love a good mystery. Everything we know about our planet comes from a deep human curiosity. And yet its power and strangeness can still catch us unaware. Rains of random objects have fallen from the sky. Decades before the bomb, an unexplained explosion flattened miles of Siberian forest. And in grain fields around the world, mysterious designs have emerged overnight our number 10 unexplained mystery. In the 1980s, flattened circles of grain began appearing in fields in England. Since then, over 2,000 crop circles, ranging from simple shapes to complex pictograms, have shown up in Japan, Australia, the former Soviet Union, and the US. Debate rages over whether these designs are extraterrestrial, natural phenomena, or man-made hoaxes. Today's crop circles can be mathematically complex and extremely precise. For many, these qualities eliminate earlier theories of natural causes. Are they also beyond human limitations? We are now into designs that are much more complex than, uh, than the simple designs of yesteryear. In short, there is much too much going on for me to believe that the pranksters, the hoaxers, play any major part at all in today's crop circles. Well, in fact, we've heard that all throughout history. We've heard that the Egyptians were just quite incapable of producing these wonderful mathematical things called pyramids. You know, they really had to have alien help. And that's really a form of racism, isn't it? Crop circle researchers point out that the flattened wheat is physically changed. Effects on plant growth can be seen for years. The plants are indeed disturbed well beyond anything that you and I could inflict on a plant. Something is going on that indicates that we are not alone in the universe. Now that's exciting. But not everyone is excited. The difference in crop circle plant structure versus the structure of plants outside the crop circle may be simply because of the way the crop circle is made. So this doesn't mean they're they're magical or extraterrestrial or anything special. Information theory would suggest there are much better ways of communicating with human beings saying that you are not alone than simply making very ornate patterns in a wheat field. So are crop circles practical jokes or alien contact? <laughs> While some circle hoaxes have been revealed as pranksters with planks, Thousands of other crop circles are still unexplained. If it isn't a hoax, then we start to use our heads to find out where it is that we stand in regards to an intelligence that is coming to us from elsewhere. My theory is that indeed we have visitors to this planet. Mainstream science has not yet taken crop circles seriously, but the messages are out there, written across our wheat fields for all to see. Our number 10 unexplained mystery may hold messages from outer space. Could number 9 hold messages from heaven? On September 21, 1995, there were reports around the world of Hindu statues drinking milk offerings. 
Thousands witnessed this phenomenon, and the city of New Delhi ground to a halt as millions left their jobs to test their own shrines. Miracle or mass hysteria? With all the important things going on in the world, all the great places where God could be doing some really meaningful miracles, that's the best God can do is absorb soak milk through his representative stone statues. I think it's pathetic. The Catholic Church also takes an unexpectedly dim view of most miraculous claims. A figure appears by some normal natural phenomena of discoloration on a glass window, and it looks a bit like an outline of a picture of the Virgin Mary. Well, people get all excited. The church in modern times never would give any approval to such an event. Like everybody else, the church lives in the time it lives in, and we live in a scientific time. So where can a person find proof of God in this scientific age? The most studied artifact in the history of man is the Shroud of Turin, believed by many to be the burial cloth of Christ mentioned in the Bible. We were the first scientific team ever given an extensive period of time for an in-depth examination of the Shroud, which we did over a period of 120 hours in October of 1978. One of the very first things that was discovered about the shroud was that, wait a minute, unlike all of the artist's renderings and paintings that throughout history, this shows blood stains in the wrists, not in the palm. The shroud also shows scourge marks from a Roman whip and blood from a crown of thorns. In recorded documented history, we only have one person who suffered a particular set of tortures, and that man was Jesus. Results of the first investigations were so promising that in 1988, the Catholic Church agreed to test the age of the shroud. If the shroud dated back to the first century, it would be considered physical evidence of the existence of Jesus Christ. But carbon-14 testing revealed that the shroud dated back no earlier than the 13th century. For some, this was enough to dismiss the shroud as a hoax. But there were factors that called the accuracy of the test into question. The protocol itself was modified at the last minute. Rather than seven tests across different sections of the shroud, it was narrowed down to one test. Also in 1532, it's believed that a fire scorched the shroud, possibly rendering the carbon dating inaccurate. But skeptics wonder why the shroud is tested at all. Using materials available to a medieval artist, Joe Nickel is able to create a convincing shroud. Here's an image that I've taken a little more care with and finished and mounted. Now when we photograph this, we get this effect, which looks very much like the mysterious face on the Shroud of Turin. But painted replicas fail to refute the obvious. I always tell folks that if it were a painting, simple science would have made that discovery many years ago. So is this Shroud medieval science or a miracle? I don't think it's that critical that we find out the truth behind the shroud. From a spiritual point of view, the image is already there. That really becomes less a matter of science and more a matter of faith. While number nine appeals to our spiritual hopes, unexplained mystery number eight has a grip on our darkest terrors. It's hard to look even a few feet into Loch Ness in Scotland, and yet a strange creature has been spotted 10,000 times in these murky depths. Although one famous photo of the Loch Ness Monster has been revealed as a hoax, millions of dollars have been spent searching for the beast in the loch. The best evidence so far is little more than a few ambiguous sonar hits. 
In the case of Loch Ness, it has been searched for 40 years. No one has found anything. You have one small loch in Scotland that should contain the monster. There's nothing there. I'm sorry, there's nothing there. The same has been said for the most famous monster on land. Until the first gorilla was brought out of the jungle, accounts by African explorers of giant hairy beasts were discounted as fantasy. So is it possible that there is another undiscovered ape roaming the world? This one reaching heights of up to 12 feet. In the United States, the Indians have a long tradition of, uh, of knowledge of the existence of this creature. It's not something that just has started in the 50s and 60s when the name Bigfoot was popularized. Reports of upright apes are not limited to the U.S. China, Russia, and South America all have their hairy wild men. I mean, you're crossing a wide range of cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, and even time. And people are still reporting the same kind of thing. That's the kind of anecdotal evidence that means something. Is there any real evidence that this animal actually exists? DNA tests on hair samples found at Bigfoot sightings reveal that the hair comes from a primate. Yet the tested samples are too small for further identification. The primary evidence is the footprints. That's where the name Bigfoot comes from. The footprints are there. They're real. They are measurable. Some of the footprints that have been found have dermal ridges in them, the equivalent of your fingerprints. Um, things that your average hoaxer wouldn't take the time to do. But do individual hoaxes explain the footprints that have been found worldwide? The consistency of the tracks over decades and spread geographically across the United States, to have such a concerted effort of hoaxers is really more difficult to conceive than the idea that there is a Bigfoot creature roaming around. The only way Bigfoot could exist for this long is if there was a decent-sized breeding population. And since these things have been spotted all over the world, there would have to be countless good-sized breeding populations. Statistically speaking, by now, we would have found some bodies, and we haven't. So in my opinion, they don't exist. But some say it's also hard to find a bear carcass, and nobody doubts that bears exist. When animals die, the other animals spread the carcass around, and so it just doesn't last very long. But without bones, blood, or a body, Bigfoot remains relegated to the forests of mythology. The only way to definitively prove that there's a Bigfoot out there is to bring in a body. We keep saying it's just a matter of time. Until that time, humans can only wonder about the existence of another primate who walks upright. From fields to forests to the face of Christ, these are just some of the top ten unexplained mysteries. And our list gets even more bizarre. Next, we climb aboard an abandoned ship in search of mystery number seven. Hey, this is a good day for a ghost hunt. <laughs> living world, there are things beyond reason. It was a feeling more than anything for me. Strange energies sort of surrounding us. I felt someone tap me on my side, and I realized I was home alone. But how do you reason with things that aren't living? No, I've just seen a gentleman walk straight through. There was a cover-up, and it's perfect. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She's panicking. Guiding spirits into the light. Rescue mediums. Saturdays and Sundays on Zone Reality. Once you step through these doors, it's serious. Some people have died, some people have lived. Working 24 hours straight can be a regular shift. We can go longer. And where your first thought might be their last rites. It's remarkable how the body can heal itself. 
In trauma, the theatre's a stage where every act could save someone's life. It's about as good as it gets. Discover the stories behind the statistics in trauma. Saturdays and Sundays on Zone Reality. Britain's obesity rates are enormous. I know that it's the wrong food for me, but I can't stop it. Every day's a struggle. Diets don't seem to be working. These are people who have tried everything. So the last resort is going under the knife. Meet the surgeon fighting to restore the nation's health. There is no margin for error. I've lost seven stone in seven months. People smile at me now. Fat Doctor, Mondays to Fridays on Zone Reality. Our list of the ultimate ten unexplained mysteries so far includes crop circles, miracles, and monsters. Number seven deals with this world and the afterworld. In Alameda Bay sits the last of a great line of warships. No longer in active duty, the only inhabitants of the USS Hornet are the many who have died and returned to spend eternity aboard. I feel no. I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah, it's in that corner. It's in that corner. It's in that corner, yeah. Yeah. He burned himself. Ow. Hey, this is a good, good day for a ghost hunt. <laughs> okay. As long as there have been people, there have been ghost sightings. In the records of ancient civilizations, there is talk of spirits of people after they have died, whether they've gone to, to an afterlife or are stuck around here. So this is a very ancient thing because it's part of human experience. If seeing is believing, then photographs provide the most tantalizing evidence of ghosts. One of the things when we look at ghost photographs from the middle to late 19th century, they were almost invariably deliberate forgeries. Most of the ghost photographs that are made today are created by accident. The flash can go off outdoors and capture water droplets in the air, or often the camera's own strap. I'm going to take a picture of our model here and I'm going to dangle the camera strap in front of the lens and we'll see how that photo comes out. The person knows that he or she didn't see anything like that, so the assumption is made that this is some sort of a paranormal event. But what about cases where more than one person reports seeing the same ghost? On the USS Hornet, three people say they have seen the ghost of Rear Admiral J.J. Clark. I do pick up somebody that is working at some cab... It was a desk or cabinet or something. Um... Immediately when I came on the ship, I had encountered the spirit of Admiral J.J. Clark. He was a rear admiral that served on the ship between 1944 and 45. When I saw the spirit go down the ladder below me, uh, I saw him with both eyes, and I was looking straight at him. It wasn't just a glimpse. I saw someone, a man. Um, his arms were to the side, just standing up straight. When I saw a picture of the Admiral, it was the same features. He's the same man I saw. Bingo. Uh... Bingo. Uh... But why would ghosts return from the dead? It makes perfect sense that ghosts are seen where people are. And it makes perfect sense that you typically find an association with the location. It essentially boils down to the fact that ghosts are people too. They're dead people, but they're still people. People many believe who can teach us something. And down in that it corridor, I've picked up somebody else. Having the ability to see the souls that have passed on has given me um, a wonderful knowledge and understanding of the life and death process, which really uh, we think of life as a process, but we don't really include death in it. Death is a part of life. That's a part of the process of life.
It may be comforting to believe that we don't disappear after death, but for those who are still alive and healthy, the number six unexplained mystery may be the trick to staying that way. Tuesday, Father Peter McCall and Mary Ann Lacey conduct healing services in Dobbs Ferry, New York. Hundreds come to be cured of physical ills through the power of God. Praise is given and healing is received. I know that it was God's hand that healed me. Uh, I have no other explanation of it. I just know that that's true. The biopsy showed negative. Wasn't any signs of cancer. Do I believe it's a miracle? Absolutely. Healing miracles are the only modern miracles accepted by the Catholic Church in the canonization of saints. As such, they are rigorously tested. For a healing miracle to be certified, it must be a life-threatening symptom whose existence is proven by empirical scientific data, for instance, x-ray, cured instantly or very rapidly without any medical treatment, without a recovery period, and without a relapse. Kashin darakia, son darakia, help him, Lord. I credit the Catholic Church with being reasonable about their investigations. The problem here is that having a doctor say, we can't explain it, technically that's all it means. That doesn't mean it's an inexplicable, which therefore requires some miraculous intervention to explain it. It just means we don't know. And I hear you're doing very well, huh? That Jesus is healing you, huh? Go ahead, Father. Most diseases get better on their own. Even serious diseases can go into remission. We know that in almost every form of cancer, there is a certain percentage of cases that go into spontaneous remission. We don't know why, but someone just happens to be at the right place at the right time, and their illness goes into remission, they're likely to say, I think it was the healer. Spontaneous re remission is the medical term for a miracle. It means the same thing. It's the limitation of their profession that they can only deal with, with the physical things that they see in front of them. A, a miracle is beyond that. It's beyond the laws of nature. Thank you for bringing her here today that she may experience your love and your peace and your consolation. If people believe that faith healing is making them feel this good, what's the danger? The danger in, in people believing in miracles is this. You actually have documented cases of people giving up their traditional medicines and taking on these other uh, worthless things and dying. Miracle or medical fluke? Those who have been healed feel they already have the answer. People have said to me, but MS goes into remission, Jane. And I'm like, you know, if that's what you want to believe, that's fine. But in, in my deepest being, I was healed through the power of Jesus Christ. From wandering spirits to the power of prayer, can we beat death by conviction alone? Coming up, burning bodies and sightless vision continue our countdown of the ultimate 10 unexplained mysteries. You wouldn't like these guys knocking on your door. But when the law is broken... 200,000 dollars worth of drugs. God, God, God. A community is in danger. The public are warned not to approach him. The danger is real that he'll use violence. And lives are at risk. Nothing but cold-blooded murder. Now, heavily armed police have swarmed on this suburb. Who are you going to call? This is the sort of job we love doing. The Force, Mondays to Fridays on Zone Reality. First, there's the shock. There was no way she would have left us. Then comes the anger. It's a, it's a twisted tale. And after the grief, there has to be justice. 
If you're innocent, you'll be found innocent. We were hoping that we had already got our guy. Motives may be powerful, but the truth lies in the facts. There was just too much evidence there. Bringing the past to life to protect our future. Medical Detectives, Mondays to Fridays on Zone Reality. Some have seen ghosts disappear like smoke. But what about humans who burst into flame? If I were not there to see it, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. There was uh, a little bit of a leg and a little bit of a skull left. The rest was ash. Number five on our list may well be the most gruesome of human mysteries. SHC, spontaneous human combustion. Spontaneous human combustion is the ability of the body to smoke, blister, or otherwise burn without contacting a source of ignition. Spontaneous human combustion is horrific, macabre, and according to mainstream science, impossible. Since the earliest cases of SHC in the 15th century, spontaneous human combustion has sometimes been explained as punishment from God. A hundred years ago, it was claimed that all victims of spontaneous human combustion were alcoholics and drunkards. This was the vengeful wrath of God for living an immoral and temperate life. In the 20th century, there were over 300 purported incidents of spontaneous combustion. And by all reports, this phenomenon is on the rise. In 1974, the late Jack Angel survived a fire that doctors said came from the inside out. When Mr. Angel awoke from a prolonged sleep, he noticed that his right forearm and hand had been charred black, burned to the bone, he told us. We have Mr. Angel's medical records based on that treatment. The medical reports diagnose the injuries as, quote, internal in origin. Peter Jones claims to be a victim of SHC. His wife was a witness. All of a sudden, he appeared to erupt in a cloud of smoke, and it appeared to be coming from his legs. And I jumped up and looked under the bed and the covers and everything and couldn't find anything burning. When it was over, I said, what was that, Peter? And he said, beats the hell out of me. Could it have been spontaneous human combustion? People that don't think it exists, that's, that's great. I mean, I really don't care whether they think it exists or not. It happened to me. One of the strangest and most investigated SHC cases of the 20th century is the fiery fate of fireman George Mott. On the mattress in which Mr. Mott burned through lay one lower right leg, severed cleanly just below the knee joint. The rest of Mr. Mott's 180-pound body had burned basically to powder. The individual himself burnt through the floor and the damn house didn't burn down. So how do you do that? What could have caused this blaze? And how can a fire burn so hot that it consumes a man, yet leaves the room standing? Our people went through the electrical, went through the gas stove, went through the heater. We determined that it was not suicide. We determined it was not a homicide. The only thing possible would be spontaneous human combustion. But not everyone agrees. Scientists claim that spontaneous human combustion is not paranormal, but the product of the wick effect, in which the body catches fire and burns in its own fuel. In some cases, accidental fire deaths look just like SHC. In 1997, John DeHaan tested this theory by setting fire to a 120-pound pig carcass wrapped in a cotton blanket. 
one of the most startling effects of these kinds of scenes is the destruction of the bones. They actually still looked like they were intact, but if you attempted to touch them, they were like picking up a cigarette ash. They would just crumble. The experiment proved to scientists that a fire can reduce a body to ash without spreading. But for believers, there were two problems. That's not really a fair experiment because in many cases that history is called SHC, there is no external ignition. If you don't have an external ignition source, if you don't have an accelerant dousing the body to make it more flammable, then you apparently have a real dilemma, which brings us back to spontaneous human combustion. So what is behind these amazing blazes that seem to erupt from within the human body? In our 25 years of research into this phenomenon, we have yet to find someone who, having seen all the evidence, can tell us, oh yes, this is how this happened. Spontaneous human combustion is one of the great mysteries confronting medicine and mankind. If the body has the unexplained ability to burst into flame, what unexplained power accounts for mystery number four? Prediction is a billion-dollar business. Two-thirds of Americans believe in psychic phenomena, and 60% believe that they have had psychic experiences. Is it possible to see across time and space? One of the common methods that psychics use to get people to believe in them is something called a multiple out. For example, let's assume I had a dream last night in which I was in a serious car accident. And sometime in the next day or week, I'm in a serious car accident. That can make the dream look prophetic. But what if my friend is in a serious car accident? My girlfriend is in one. That's a hit, too. There's a lot of shoe fitting going on in regard to psychic experiences. But this is precisely why we bring ESP into the laboratory. One of the more successful experiments that we've been using and other labs have been using is called the Gansfeld experiment. In this experiment, a sender attempts to mentally communicate an image to a partner rooms away. The receiver then tries to pick the same image from a choice of four. Random chance allows that one in four guesses will be correct, a 25% hit rate. What we're finding is 34, 35, even higher percentages of hitting, which means that somehow these subjects are getting the information more than chance would allow. Because of the success of such experiments, when the U.S. received reports during the Cold War that the Russians were using psychic spies to gather intelligence and plan military tactics, they didn't laugh. They spent $20 million playing catch-up. The Stargate program was a federally funded uh, investigation of extrasensory perception to see whether, first, whether it was real, or secondly, if it were real, could we use it for matters of national interest, like for the military or to gather intelligence. We worked at empty desks with papers and pens. Normally, our tasking was usually given to us in a sealed envelope. What they would say to us is uh, something like, well, we've lost a uh, piece of equipment, and it can be anywhere in the northeastern continental United States. You need to tell us where it's located. For over 17 years, Joe McMonagle was one of this country's top remote viewers, a military term for a clairvoyant. In 1981, Stargate used McMonagle in an effort to locate General James Dozier, kidnapped in Italy by the Red Brigades. McMonagle was able to provide a street name, building floor, and a description of the general's condition, all details that were confirmed as accurate during Dozier's retrieval. My accuracy in the Dozier case really surprised me. With remote viewing, it's one of the surprises you always get. Uh, see, one of the deficiencies with remote viewing is really knowing just how accurate the information is until it's used. Theories abound, but nobody knows for certain how this critical information is actually transmitted or received. Information goes from here to here in ways we don't understand. We name that anomaly extrasensory perception. Do I believe in it? No. But is the evidence for something interesting going in? Absolutely. From inexplicable human incineration to extrasensory perception, numbers five and four prove that some of the world's ultimate mysteries lie within the human body. Coming up, believers and skeptics argue, are we alone?
in the living world, there are things beyond reason. It was a feeling more than anything for me. Strange energies sort of surrounding us. I felt someone tap me on my side. And I realized I was home alone. But how do you reason with things that aren't living? No, I've just seen a gentleman walk straight through. The walls are cover up and it's perfect. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She's panicking. Guiding spirits into the light. Rescue mediums. Saturdays and Sundays on Zone Reality. Once you step through these doors, it's serious. Some people have died, some people have lived. Working 24 hours straight can be a regular shift. We can go longer. And where your first thought might be their last rites. It's remarkable how the body can heal itself. In trauma, the theater's a stage where every act could save someone's life. It's about as good as it gets. Discover the stories behind the statistics in trauma. Saturdays and Sundays on Zone Reality. Britain's obesity rates are enormous. I know that it's the wrong food for me, but I can't stop it. Every day's a struggle. Diets don't seem to be working. These are people who have tried everything. So the last resort is going under the knife. Meet the surgeon fighting to restore the nation's health. There is no margin for error. I've lost seven stone in seven months. People smile at me now. Fat Doctor, Mondays to Fridays on Zone Reality. Our ultimate 10 countdown of unexplained mysteries already includes ghosts and ESP. If spirits and thoughts may travel through the air, what about the number three mystery? Unexplained flying objects. Say, have you all had any uh, reports of unknown flying objects over there? No, we haven't. Oh, okay, we're wondering. We supposedly are having quite an invasion over here. <laughs> While conducting research at the National Archives, Sam Sherman discovered a declassified audio tape, rare government documentation of a UFO sighting. On October 7th, 1965, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, the air traffic controller noticed odd luminous objects coming over the field. According to Sherman, these objects were picked up on radar at eight different defense locations across the western U.S. Fearing enemy craft, the Air Force launched their own planes to investigate. This thing just, bing, went up, evaded him, and that was it. Accounts of unidentified lights in the sky date back at least to the Middle Ages. They weren't called UFOs, they weren't called flying saucers, but certainly they would be the same type of phenomena. It's been there throughout history if you know how to look and where to look. Human interpretations of UFOs have changed with the times. Medieval sightings were interpreted as signs from God. 18th century naturalists called them gas and plasma. During the Industrial Revolution, these sightings became machines and aircraft. And with the Space Age came the era of the Flying Saucer. I am here to discuss the so-called Flying Saucers. By 1948, sightings of UFOs by credible witnesses were so numerous that the Air Force decided to investigate. For over two decades, Project Blue Book collected information on 12,600 reported cases of objects in the sky, from weather balloons to meteorological events. In 1969, the project was shut down with this statement. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion, and that is that it does not contain any conceivable threat to the United States. It's important to make the distinction between the question, are there extraterrestrial intelligences somewhere in the universe, and have they actually come here? There are thousands, even tens of thousands of sightings around the world annually, but, but most of these, of course, everyone would admit, 90%, even high 90s percent, that these are natural phenomena. Many people don't even realize that the stars actually appear to move during the night. 
misidentification is rampant, but ufologists insist that alien crafts bear uniform traits. They move in ways that airplanes just don't move in. We're talking right angle turns, stop on a dime, hover, go straight up in the air, uh, come down in, in weird floating patterns like a leaf. Well, we don't know what extraterrestrial or other intelligence type craft should look like, but we know what our own stuff looks like. If we find something up there which doesn't obey the laws of physics as we know it, we can say that they belong to somebody else. Somebody else knows something we don't. On September 19, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill were driving through New Hampshire around midnight when they claimed to have spotted a pancake-shaped light with two rows of windows that appeared to be following them. Two hours later, Barney and Betty woke up 35 miles south of where they had stopped. Under hypnosis, nightmare images of having hair, fingernail, and skin samples removed, and descriptions of small gray aliens came flooding back. The Hill story was the first the world heard of unexplained mystery number two. Since that night in 1961, thousands more have come forward with the claim that they too were the victims of alien abductions and experiments. An abduction experience is fast, efficient, very traumatic to the person, and very often the memory of it is partially wiped out. Debate in the field of hypnosis throws the accuracy of recalled abduction memories into question. This is a case of false memories planted by therapists through this guided imagery, this fantasy role-playing, because that's what hypnosis is. It's fantasy role-playing between the hypnotist and the subject. But hypnotherapists believe that they can prove that a hypnotized subject will not simply go along with a guided story. In a given hypnotic session, I can ask probably 10, 20 uh, leading questions, false leads, and uh, I've never had anybody slip up. Since most described abductions occur in bed at night, skeptics dismiss the phenomenon as sleep paralysis. This occurs when a person is in that funny in-between state between just falling asleep and just being awake. During that state, your body is usually paralyzed, but your mind is awake. Apparently the dream mechanism is kind of kicking on, so you're having these dreams, but you're awake but paralyzed. There's a lot of attendant other things which do not go along with sleep paralysis. For instance, if you have a group of people who have been taken from different places into the same craft, when they're dressed, sometimes they go back in somebody else's clothes. A woman who had a running suit on when she went to bed or doesn't own a nightgown, when they put her back in bed, she was wearing somebody's fancy nightgown that she was terrified to find. For Beth Collings and Anna Jamerson, the proof is in the memories. They say they have been abducted together, and more than once. Beth and I have many recollections of experiences where we have been abducted together. And one morning, we were both feeling pretty sick, and I said, something happened. And she says, well, last night, the aliens were there, and I saw them inject something in the back of your neck. Can I check the back of your neck underneath your hair? I said, sure, you won't find anything. But she did. There was a hole in the back of my neck exactly where she had seen them inject me with something into the back of my brain. I thought being crazy would be preferable to telling anyone, even Anna, that this is what I remembered. I couldn't pretend that it didn't happen and I couldn't forget what I remembered. When you have evidence like that, it's very hard not to believe that you are really being abducted. And I know I'm being abducted. After I had gone through so many cases and seen so much trauma and so much physical evidence, 
I, at some point, was asked, do you really believe all this? And I said, with sadness, I realize I no longer have the luxury of this belief. From strange ships in the sky to stranger trips on board, Unexplained Mysteries 3 and 2 prove our fascination with life beyond our world. From the inner mind to outer space, the debate between belief and skepticism brings us to the ultimate mystery. From the moment we are born, we inch toward our own demise. The concept of an afterlife is the founding principle behind all major religions. But the number one unexplained mystery remains. Is there any proof of life after death? I had lost my body and I'd become a little blue star. At the time, this seemed like a very normal thing for me to have happen. <laughs> I had an, an idea of myself going, wow, I don't have a body anymore. I'm free of my body. If you can imagine on Star Trek when they go into warp speed, uh, you see all the lights kind of go, whew, well, that's how it felt. And now I'm going, at, at what felt like, I don't know, a zillion miles an hour. Every culture has its own idea of the afterworld. But where do we get our knowledge of worlds beyond the living? There's been an effort for at least a century to examine the afterlife and visitations with the dead and spiritual communication. People don't want to die. They're crushed when their loved ones die. What can they do? Can they transcend death? Oh, I think life after death, God, the spirit world, something that's beyond the physical here and now, that's the ultimate mystery that fascinates people and cannot be tested ultimately uh, by science and short of going there. <laughs> but you can't come back to report what happened. Or can we? Advanced medical technology can now bring people back 10, 20, even 30 minutes after the heart or lungs stop functioning. Those that come back from the brink share stunningly similar tales. Very commonly, people have what's called an out-of-body experience. In other words, they see their consciousness apart from their body. Very often following that, they'll have a tunnel experience. At the end of that tunnel, they'll generally encounter beings of light. These beings may be deceased relatives or friends or perhaps religious figures. Very often at this time, they'll have a life review. Some scientists contend that these experiences actually describe the physiological process of death. What happens in near-death experiences from a physiological point of view is that the brain loses its oxygen supply or its oxygen supply is reduced. That causes neurons in the visual part of the brain, the visual cortex, to start responding very rapidly for a period of time. And that results in the perception of these long tunnels, bright lights, that sort of thing. In laboratory tests, gravity-induced loss of consciousness has produced out-of-body experiences, tunnel vision and white lights, replicating some, but not all, of the near-death experience. About 15% of people have what we call frightening near-death experiences. There were people being tortured and volcanoes erupting and brown sludge and screaming and people you know, just their heads on, on pikes and everything you can imagine of in the, in the classic idea of a hell. If it was true that it was just the body's physiological response to death, I would think that everyone would have an identical experience, but I didn't. Experiencers have read tags off the top of ceiling fans, recounted conversations rooms away, and even brought tangible information back from beyond. Occasionally during near-death experience accounts, people encounter someone that identifies themselves as a relative that they had during their life. And they may say, I don't remember, I never had a brother, I never had a sister. And yet, they come to find out that this was a brother or a sister who died perhaps very, very early in their life. It's certainly evidential that something's going on up there. If people have returned from the brink and beyond, what messages are they bringing back? What I experienced was a huge downloading of information. Before I could ask, you know, well, what, what, you know, am I dying? I heard, 
we don't die. The body dies, the spirit, the soul never dies. Probably the greatest mystery that confronts humanity is what happens after we die. Millions of people have had experiences like this. This is very common. The message they bring back, very consistent. There is an afterlife, and it's wonderful. Is there life at the end of the tunnel? The ultimate question wraps up our countdown of the ultimate 10 unexplained mysteries. The need to create an orderly world governed by dependable rules is central to the human mind. And yet the ultimate answers continue to elude us. Although we have learned more about the Earth and the cosmos in the last 25 years than in all recorded history, the more we probe, the more mysterious the world has become. In the expanding sphere of scientific knowledge, the more it grows, the greater its contact with the unknown. And so it will always encounter more and more unknown. We're never going to know everything.